Now that Washington has stepped out of public life, we're ready for a presidential election that will not include George Washington. So for the first time in American history, we actually have political parties that are going to nominate candidates. The Federalist candidate is going to be John Adams. He served as vice president under Washington, so he seems like a natural fit. The Democratic-Republican candidate will be Thomas Jefferson. And you can see the result here is, while it is close, Adams wins a majority of the electoral vote. Jefferson came in second, so Adams became the vice, the president, I'm sorry, Adams became the president, and Jefferson became the vice president. Adams is going to have a lot of problems as president, and one of them is the fact that we are going to now have a president and vice president from different political parties. Remember that while Washington didn't actually belong to any political party, he certainly seemed to lean toward the Federalists, which is where Adams fell in. Now we've got Adams coming in, and Jefferson has a very different belief system on how the government ought to operate, and that is going to cause problems for Adams. He's not going to really be able to go to Jefferson and get advice. Another problem is that Adams is no George Washington. He simply doesn't command the respect that Washington is going to. And Washington, or I'm sorry, and Adams also has a problem that his personality is one that's very difficult to adapt to the presidency. By that, I mean Adams is known to have a really bad temper. Washington had a temper as well, but he worked very hard at keeping it under control, and it was rarely seen. Adams does not have that. He lets his temper out a lot more, which doesn't endear him to the people with whom he works. Lastly, Adams is going to set a lot of precedents himself. One is, what do you do when you are the first president to take over for an outgoing president? Adams actually decided to keep Washington's cabinet, which turned out to be not a very good idea, because that cabinet was loyal to Washington. They are not loyal to Adams. So let's take a look at the major events of the Adams administration. He is going to be known for the XYZ Affair, the Alien Act, the Sedition Act, and lastly, the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. So let's start with how things are leading up to this event that becomes known as the XYZ Affair. With a little bit of background, remember that France and England have gone to war against each other, and the United States chose to be neutral, and France is not terribly happy about that. On top of it, the United States it has made Jay's Treaty, and Jay's Treaty really seems like the United States and Britain are getting a bit too friendly for the opinions of the French people. So because of those two things, we are going to see tensions rise between the U.S. and France. Democratic Republicans are angry because Adams begins building up an army and a navy. He wants to have a standing army in peacetime, and he's going to uh, begin working on building a 30-ship navy. So the Democratic Republicans feel that Adams is kind of preparing for a war. The Federalists are upset because it seems, in their opinion, that Adams is not doing enough to go to war. Adams is not ready for a war. He says we are not financially ready for that, and he would like to make peace instead. The problem is the French are continuing to attack American ships going to Britain. It's the same thing that Britain is doing. Both Britain and France are attacking American ships that are going to the enemy country. And Adams is trying to figure out how do we make peace with France, which makes the Federalists unhappy, but also prepare for the possibility of war with France. And that is going to make the Democratic Republicans unhappy. In an effort to make peace, what Adams does is he decides to send three American diplomats to France to hopefully talk and to work things out. Let's see if we can make a treaty. When those three American diplomats arrive in France, they are met by three French um, officials from the government. And those three French officials we know as Mr. X, Mr. Y, and Mr. Z. Kind of like how in algebra class, when you're solving for un the unknown two plus x equals 3, and you have to figure out what is x. That's why we're using the letters here. When these three Americans are met by Mr. X, Y, and Z in France, what happens next is they make a demand. 
Mr. X, Y, and Z demand several things of the United States. They first tell our three diplomats that if you would like to actually talk to someone about maybe the French no longer attacking American ships that are going to Britain, you will have to pay us a bribe. Then we will take you to go talk to the person you need to talk to to make that happen. Secondly, we are fighting a war against Britain and we want the United States to lend us several million dollars. Ten million dollars would certainly be nice for the United States to lend to France in our war against England. Lastly, they say that we would like a public apology from the American president, Mr. Adams, for not really being terribly supportive of the French. The three American diplomats are stunned that this is what's happening. So what they decide to do is they say, we need to talk to President Adams about this, see exactly how he wants us to proceed. Now this is where Adams' temper actually comes in handy. When Adams finds out about this, he reacts terribly. He is livid that when he's trying to make peace with a different country, this is how that country is treating the U.S. And so he decides that he is going to embarrass the French by publishing all of this. He lets, uh, lets it be known to Congress. He lets it be known to newspapers, really anyone who will listen, what the French did, because this is not how civilized nations are supposed to act. President Adams lets all of this be known to the American public and really does successfully embarrass the French for their behavior. When the American people re find out, they react by, you see this huge surge of American pride. People look at Adams and they support him because there's no way Adams is going to pay a bribe. And the American people love that. He refuses to hand over a loan. And again, the American people love that. And he won't apologize. And again, the American people love that. You start to see this really strong, um, positive reaction for John Adams, who really has never experienced that. This is new for him, the idea of actually being popular. But it is John Adams, and it's not going to last. And it begins to crumble when Congress, which is dominated by uh, Democrat, I'm sorry, Congress is dominated by Federalists, they pass a series of three laws known as the Alien Acts. Here's what they do. These three laws do not affect American citizens. It affects uh, aliens. And by an alien, we mean someone who is foreign to the United States, not yet a citizen. And they're specifically aiming these laws at the French aliens in the U.S. And these laws say the president now has the authority to imprison or deport any alien of enemy countries that he feels are dangerous. So that is one and two uh, of the laws right there. It lastly says, if you would like to become an American citizen and change the amount of time that you are an alien, we are going to change the time requirement for U.S. citizenship from five to 14 years. So you will be living under the Alien Act for a longer amount of time. And while people are kind of stunned by the audacity of this, another key part to understand is this. Many immigrants choosing to come to the U.S. and eventually becoming citizens, many of them are joining the Democratic Republican Party because they are not these wealthy people that the Federalists seem to really get their support from. So by extending the time period that you are not yet a citizen, we're also making it a longer period of time uh, from when, until you are able to vote and that did not go unnoticed. The second, um, or the next law that gets passed by the Federalists in Congress and signed into law by Adams is going to be the Sedition Act. And this was a huge misstep. The Sedition Act says that citizens can be jailed or fined for criticizing the government. The exact wording was if you made false or malicious statements. Now, realistically, we also have the First Amendment, which says you have freedom of speech. And remember, we talked about that means you are able to criticize the government, except now the government has made a law that says you can't do that. So the Sedition Act, a lot of people say this is pretty clearly a violation of the First Amendment to the Constitution. But what exactly to do? 
Thomas Jefferson can't believe this. And so what he does is he teams up with his friend, James Madison, and they write an essay, in, in essence, that becomes known as the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. In this paper, this essay that they write, they question whether the Sedition Act is even constitutional because they say, it seems that the Sedition Act violates the First Amendment to the Constitution, therefore it shouldn't even be there. So what do you do while you're waiting for the government to take this law away? Madison and Jefferson create this theory of nullification. And in this theory of nullification that they talk about in their paper, they say that they are going to declare that law, the Sedition Act, null and void. To be null and void means that it is, the law is non-existent, that's null, and void is not legally enforceable. So there is no legal basis to actually try to enforce the Sedition Act. Once these two men write their paper, they then show it to the various state governments. The state legislatures or the state government for Virginia and for Kentucky, which is now a state, approve of this. They say, yes, we believe that we as a state have the right to declare a national law null and void. So we don't need the uh, Supreme Court to do this for us. We as a state have that right. We are not telling other states what they have to do. We're not telling the U.S. government what they have to do. We're simply saying within our state, we are not going to enforce this law. Nine other states reject this theory. They reject Madison and Jefferson's paper. And you now have this question of what happens if the U.S. government passes a law that some people say is not legal? This issue of nullification is for now going to go untested. But what we have is the state defiance of national law is very clear. So when the state says one thing, that it's not going to follow a national law, and the national government says, yes, you have to follow it, question remains, who gets the final say? The reason this goes untested is because in the next presidential election, you're going to see a lot of the Federalists lose their re-election campaign. A lot of Democratic Republicans do get elected, and so they are going to see to it that the Alien and the Sedition Acts are no longer around. So like I said, we don't really get to see what happens when states challenge the national law because these laws are taken away. But this is something that's going to come up again over and over until we get to the Civil War.